Good evening, evening, BNG 426 class. Here is today's lecture. I do apologize for the lateness of it, uh, but here is the lecture, Metabolic Network Structure, Flux Analysis. Um, we're going to continue our week of network analysis here. And a reminder that there is a flipped classroom activity on Friday on the 15th. Uh, we will be talking about metabolic networks again and finishing off uh, this week of networks. And we will uh, be building a metabolic network in our teams uh, on Friday. So let's have a bit of a different take. We've been talking about uh, metabolic networks um, in sort of a basic um, standpoint, let's say, um, on for Monday, uh, let's get a little bit of a different take on it and talk about flux through networks, control in networks, um, basically the Stephanopoulos take on metabolic networks here. So we'll start at the branch, the branched metabolic pathways. There are a lot of branches that will probably be occurring in most networks. Very few networks would be completely linear. Branching is really the simplest trait that is common to complex systems, and networks certainly fit the bill of being complex systems. Each branch point would add another level of complexity to a metabolic network. It is important to, in this case, uh, is important to locate any branch points of consequence, and then it is also important to understand flux control distributions at branch points, especially those branch points of consequence. Uh, so let's think about flux in metabolic networks, which should not be too hard because we've been thinking about flux in metabolic pathways, and really it's only a level of granularity that we're talking about. Um, a lot of things that are applicable in pathways are also applicable in networks. There's just a little bit more in intricacies going on here. So we can, in networks, we can determine the effect of each individual reaction in that network. However, that usually is impractical, again, because of that complexity. It is just more effective in a network to group reactions and investigate the role that each group has in controlling the overall flux. So if this sounds familiar, uh, of course you will remember it from the top-down approach that we discussed when we discussed metabolic control analysis and in terms of grouping reactions around a key uh, metabolite, sometimes known as a link metabolite. So the concept of a flux, of flux determination in a network is simple. It's an extension of flux determination in a metabolic pathway. Putting that flux determination in the network into practice can be a bit more involved. So there are steps to flux analysis in networks. We would first need to develop rules for grouping reactions and pathways. And if that sounds overly vague and arbitrary, that would be because it really has to be overly vague and arbitrary because like I told you on Monday, these networks are user defined. It's what you put into it. It's what you want to put into it. It's what you want to get out of it. Um, that's the key here. You make your own network depending on the question you're asking, depending on what you want to study. So of course gr grouping your reactions within that network, that's going to fall to you to develop those rules that make sense in order to be able to do that. Then you would determine the group flux control coefficients, and of course we'll talk a little bit about group flux control coefficients. Um, they are in many ways similar to talking about flux control coefficients from our MCA days. We would optimize the flux of interest, presumably a flux to a product of interest. Of course there would be constraints, so we would optimize within those constraints. Then we would determine group concentration control coefficients. After that, we can determine the effect of experimental error on our results. And we are no strangers to talking about uh, experimental error and how we can um, sum, up, sum up, essentially, its effect. 
So back to the branch point. Branch point can provide insights into functioning of more complex systems. We can determine the flexibility of a flux distribution at the branch point. In this case, in our little pathway here, our branch point is this X, this metabolite X. Also, distribution of flux control within the branches uh, can be determined. Uh, which is a lot like the flux split ratio that we talked about with our metabolic flux analysis. We can examine the possibility of metabolic instabilities that result from extreme levels of link metabolite, and of course X is the link metabolite here. Extreme levels of link metabolite concentration. How is that going to affect the reactions above it, or the reactions that make the link metabolite. How is it going to affect the reactions that consume the link metabolite? So we have this simple branch pathway. It has three reactions, A, B, and C. It has our link metabolite, this X. Uh, this is produced by the reaction A. It is utilized by the reactions B and C. And of course, like we've talked about for a long time, I think like I mentioned the first day of class, steady state flux through reaction A must equal the total flux through B and C. Uh, this is uh, a common concept, it's a basic concept that we have hit upon since day one, where JA equals JB plus JC. So again, we're talking reactions, we're talking enzymes, we're talking kinetics. We will assume a standard reversible michaelis menten kinetics governs the rate of these reactions here. Uh, and so for the reactions converting substrates to product, uh, we can use this more, a little more intricate michaelis menten uh, equation here, uh, where we're looking at Cs as the concentration of our substrate, Cp is our product concentration, and then the rest of these parameters here, uh, the Ksp, the KMS, KMS, KMP, um, are all non-negative kinetic constants. Uh, and then this V here, the rate, is the net rate for the three reactions. Essentially, SA yielding at the end, SB plus SC. So a positive rate value, uh, this V, for this branch network will indicate the direction for conversion and that is from SA to SB plus SC. Uh, the flexibility of the branch point depends on the mutual disposition of the kinetic curves for the three uh, reactions here. And so the distribution of fluxes between the competing branches, our B and our C, uh, is also going to depend on the flexibility uh, of the brain of the mutual disposition of the kinetic curves for the three reactions. So the kinetic curves take on quite an importance. So this Michaelis Menten equation uh, becomes really significant going forward. So how do changes in the concentration of X, our link metabolite, how does that affect each reaction? Well for example reaction A makes X so we would use a um, rate equation that looks like this um, reactions B and C, both of which consume X, we would use a reaction that looks like this. We have VI, which could be VB, if we're talking about reaction B. Or it could be VC, if we're talking about reaction C. Three parameters, K1, K2, and Vmax effective for a particular reaction, are each composites of fixed kinetic parameters and concentrations of A, B, and C. So let's look at that graphically, uh, and we can see uh, for sure a picture is worth a thousand words here when we're talking about the um, flow and the control in these reactions, uh, where we look at the effective concentration of X, or CX, on A, the, uh, the rate of A. And we can see that the rate of A decreases as the concentration of X increases. Um, which is determined if we plug in a bunch of values for CX uh, in this equation here. And this should not be a surprise to us um, because of the way uh, these things go. And we talked about with metabolic control analysis where
a downstream metabolite uh, could end up uh, having a, an effect uh, of slowing the rate of an upstream reaction uh, in this case being uh, being a um, so we see this is uh, not a surprise here um, more graphics here the effect of the concentration of X on the rate of a downstream branch B or C here this could be B or C uh, and we can see again looking at plugging in values into this equation here that we see essentially the opposite type of behavior uh, not true opposites not a true mirror image or anything like that but the more concentration of X we have the greater the velocity or the greater the rates of either B or C in this case because A is making X uh, we see the opposite trend whereas B and C are consuming X if you give them more to consume they're going to um, consume it uh, and they're going to maximize their rate while doing so at each branch point there's competition uh, so for at X there is competition between B and C um, and that is the competition for X that link metabolite Flux distribution is an important feature of the branch point. And again, we've been talking about flux split ratios and flux distribution for a while here. Flux distribution is the ratio between the two downstream reactions. And this does sound a lot like flux split ratio. Uh, in this case, it's two downstream reactions anyway. If you have three, rea three reactions consuming X, it would be the ratio between those three, the different ratios. <clears throat> in general, flux distribution is strongly dependent on concentration of the link metabolite. So the distribution here, uh, whether X goes to uh, make SB or SC, depends on the amount of X that's available. And we can see how that might be and how that might dictate what happens uh, going forward. <clears throat> So if we have a high concentration of X, if we are at the level of X, concentration of X, at the C1 level, um, we can see that the react reactions B and C will be essentially at their effective max. And the cha little change in the concentration of X will have very little effect on either, the, either rate, either rate B or rate C. And the elasticity of B and C with respect to the concentration of X would be near zero here. So that would be a rigid branch point. This phenomenon implies that the flux distribution between B and C is fixed, um, which is a definition of a rigid branch point. So neither would change very much, as opposed to one changing a lot and one not changing so much. Which is kind of the hallmark of a flexible branch point if the concentration of X is C2 here down here uh, the small change in CX would produce a larger change in the rate of C than it would in the rate of B and you can see based on where these kinetic curve where this concentration of X is compared to the two kinetic curves under these conditions the elasticities of two the two reactions differ with respect to CX under this low concentration of CX under that condition. Thus, at that concentration of CX, we have a flexible branch point. So we can see the same system could be either a rigid or a flexible branch point, depending on the link metabolite, suggesting, again, the importance of this link metabolite X. Okay, so this is a think-pair-share that we sadly would have done but can't do. Um, because I'm not there. You want to attach a pathway to the end of this branch pathway to make a value-added product. If pathway B is your choice, how would you control the flux and direct it towards your production pathway? That essentially means how would you control the flux to make more SB, which is now an intermediate that produces your value-added product. What if pathway C was your choice? What if you needed SC? How could you do this? Well, so we've been talking about concentration control, essentially, looking at different concentration. We look at high um, concentration of, of X at C1, the flux through the reaction C, 
the VC is greater than that of B. And that's good if you want C. So if we want to make SC as an intermediate, um, then that would be great. We would want the X concentration to be at C1, roughly. But below C2, the flux through B is less affected than that of C, which is good if you want more B than C. So if you are looking to use SB as your um, intermediate to make your product, then you want to operate at an X level that is around C2. Okay, so back to grouping reactions. We talked about it briefly. Let's get a little more into it. Given the size of networks, determining flux through every single reaction in the network is impractical, given the size and the complexity of networks. A tenet of that top-down control analysis that I mentioned before that we talked about in MCA, uh, the MCA discussions, can be used. And our focus can be on groups of reactions instead of on the individual. The focus will be narrowed, hopefully, uh, at the end of our experiments on a single reaction group that exerts the most control flux. So we would try to find the single most reaction group uh, that exerts control on the flux of our, through our pathway. So the, the grouping approach allows for effective separation of coupled biological processes. For example, we could be talking about free energy production being separated from expansion flux resulting from growth. Um, we can group those two things to make them somewhat independent of each other. Uh, because of the nature of these coupled processes, the reaction groupings defined through this analysis in networks here frequently differ from groupings suggested by biochemical maps. And again, like I mentioned on Monday, this is pretty self-evident if you think about the concept of networks as a whole. Uh, the concept of pathway is one thing. You have basically the flow of carbon from substrate to product. Um, but networks are different because they're more user-defined and we're not necessarily thinking along pathway lines. That, uh, then we come to the concept of group flux control coefficients. Uh, these are similar to our flux control coefficients from the metabolic control analysis section. Uh, so the GFCCs, as they're called, uh, are the flux control coefficients that would exist were the entire reaction group just one single reaction. So. If this group A were just one single reaction taking A1 to X, uh, the group flux control coefficient would de facto be its single reaction flux control coefficient. Grouping of reactions replaces the individual steps with a virtual overall reaction, with the GFCC being equal to the sum of the FCCs, the individual reactions. We can see that here where we have our GFCC uh, of this part, group A, is 0.6, but the individual flux control coefficients add up to 6. Uh, same with group B. We have a group flux control coefficient of 0.4, um, and that is based upon flux control coefficients of 0.2 and 0.2. Uh, and this can be done because of the MCA summation theorem that we may have briefly discussed last week. And so again, let's talk about link metabolites. In complex networks, group of reactions can be identified surrounding key metabolites. Those metabolites are known as link metabolites. The GFCCs of each group surrounding a link metabolite is determined, determined separately. If the activity of each reaction step in group A of our little linear pathway here, this uh, A1 to X, were cha all changed with the same relative magnitude, the group flux control coefficient of group A upon its own flux, so the effect of the group A set of reactions on their own flux would be defined as the resultant relative change 
in the pathway flux, or the DJA over the JA. Um, and the change relative to the change of activity of each reaction in the group, so D star VA over B VA. And that'll give us this formula here. Okay, so let's, we've talked about branch points, let's also talk about the concept of independent pathways because talking about branch points leads to discussion of independent pathways. So an independent pathway is the smallest set of reactions con connecting a single network output with all the necessary inputs in a way that permits levels of intermediates to reach steady state. The requirement of invariant internal metabolite pools will ensure a steady state under a constant input. So we consider a network that has L reactions and K0 independently variable internal metabolites. And so from there we can calculate the maximum number of independent pathways, or P, to be equal to L, our L number of reactions, minus K0, which is our, which is our independently variable f internal metabolites. To the right, this little pathway here that takes A to either 2D, E, or F, there are, is an L of 5, um, and there is a K0 of 2. You can see there are only two independently variable internal metabolites. There are only two internal metabolites total. So doing our simple, simple math, we would have only three, we could have only three independent pathways here, which is more than enough. Um, so we could do this with more complex pathways. Um, and the network to the right here is the aromatic amino acid biosynthesis. The independent pathways, uh, because of all this recycling and whatnot, um, are not so obvious here. There's a lot of branching and recycling and such. We can begin identifying the independent pathways by first defining this thing called the steady state internal metabolite stoichiometry matrix, or the SIMS matrix. Okay, so to the left we have a simple network. The resulting independent pathways uh, is next to it. And below is the SIMS matrix, known as X, uh, N rather, sorry, N, 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 N. As you already know, the only internal metabolites are B and C here. And we can see that the SIMS matrix includes these two metabolites here, or at least includes lines for these two metabolites, and the stoichiometry around these two metabolites. So reaction 1, which makes B, has a positive 1. Uh, here and is as its value. And reaction two and three, which both use B, have a negative one um, in the, their respective columns. And then there's C, and for the C part of it, we have reaction two that makes C, um, and that gets a value of one, as well as reaction four and five that make ENF but consume C and that is a um, value in those columns of minus one. Okay so here is another take on a simple pathway except there's an extra reaction here you'll notice. This reaction six here that takes E back into B and makes a nice recycling pathway. Now E is an internal metabolite and our SIMS matrix grows by one row. Here you can see because B, C, and E now needed to be included in our SIMS matrix here. And we need to see where they are going. Okay, so we can begin to determine these pathways uh, by using these matrices that we are creating. Once the SIMS matrix has been satisfactorily constructed, Independent pathways are obtained as the vectors of the kernel matrix of N, N being our SIMS matrix. And by definition, a kernel matrix is any non-trivial solution to the below equation, N multiplied by K equals zero.
So here they are. Here are the K, the kernel matrices for both of these two pathways. Uh, and you can see each of the columns uh, represents the reactions of the um, three independent pathways in each case. Note that the entries of the kernel matrix vectors are representing the relative rates of reactions utilized exclusively in the corresponding independent pathway. So for that, and this is a bit of foreshadowing here, for that we need a reaction that is utilized exclusively, so we would need a product that is, u that is made exclusively or could be a substrate that is used exclusively, but in this case I think we can see where the products that are exclusively made lie in both situations. Okay, so we can determine rates and we can know a little bit more about our kernel matrix. So if Kij represents the elements of the kernel matrix, then K1j represents the rate of depletion of metabolite A. In other words, reaction one here. That's our K1j right there. The total rate of reaction one is the total rate of depletion of A. So it's not just K11 or, or what have you. It's all of them. It'd be equal to K11 plus K12 plus K13. That's the total depletion of A right there. Thus, the first column of our kernel matrix would indicate that P1, uh, our pathway one, comprises reactions 1 and 3. With indicated stoichiometry, A, con A will be converted to 2D with no net production of B and C, according to us. So the reactions that are involved uh, in P1, our pathway, our little pathway, are A is converted to B and B is converted to 2D so the sum of this is A is converted to 2D. If the stoichiometric ratio between steps is not 1 to 1 the numbers corresponding to the appropriate ratio instead will appear uh, as entries to the kernel. So the exact composition of the kernel matrix is arbitrary uh, which you may be sad to hear but it when you think of it, it's kind of true, and again, it goes back to me telling you that the network is user-defined here, so to a certain extent, the kernel matrix becomes user-defined here, uh, based on the rules that we're setting up. Uh, and the only formal constraints on the kernel are that it be full rank, and that it have independent columns. For defining reaction groups and link metabolites, you would want to use the simplest kernel possible. Okay, so we were dealing in that space. We saw a little simple equation. You had to know degrees of freedom were coming around the corner here. Uh, so a network with K0 independent steady state metabolites, uh, there are a total of K0 steady state relationships among the L reaction rates for each pathway. So equivalently, the columns of the kernel matrix uh, can also be considered here. The base of the kernel usually consists of the L minus K rows of the kernel corresponding to the steps that are unique to a single uh, independent pathway. And for that easy um, pathway or network that we were talking about earlier, uh, we know which steps are unique there because there's three unique products being made. But regardless, back to the reactions, the Reactions that make up these steps are what are known as the eigenreactions or the characteristic reactions of these pathways. Such steps are usually defined as output steps leading to different products, which is certainly the case in our little simple illustration here where we have three output steps, uh, the synthesis of 2D, the synthesis of E, and the synthesis of F. And it just so happens that we have those three degrees of freedom to define a base of three reactions. So the column of the kernel can be defined according to fundamental vectors for these three steps. And this is done by setting the three columns in the kernel matrix equal to 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1 for those reactions three
4 and 5 respectively. We apply nk equals 0 for the remainder of the elements here, and, and multiplied by k equals 0 for the remainder of the elements. So if an acceptable base is being used, that is if we got our independent reactions right, we will get a complete kernel with no negative elements. Any steady state observed in the network will be a linear combination of the basic pathways through the fluxes. Fluxes that we have established with this method that we're doing now. And that is all because we used fundamental vectors. So once the characteristic reaction for each pathway has been identified, the actual fluxes through the pathway can be found by multiplying each value within its column by the flux through its characteristic region. So, and you can see how this might work in practice because we would potentially be able to get the flux based on the production of each of the given products here. So we could measure the rates of production of each of the different products and do a little back calculating to figure out what the flux through the reaction is to make those products. So the matrix essentially would look like this where we have our 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1 as our base here. We can multiply that by J3, J4, J5 respectively and that multiplier mixed with the K values would then give us an idea of the flux throughout the entire pathway from A to product. So with the complexity of networks, and networks are usually a lot more complex than pathways, it does behoove us to group reactions when determining flux through a network. We examine the flexibility or the rigidity of our branch point. Uh, and that depends on metabolite concentration, usually. Uh, metabolite concentration through each branch point, to be more specific. When given a series of reactions, we can determine how many independent pathways can exist. And we can determine using the SIMS matrix uh, and the kernel matrix uh, to do that, to figure out how many independent pathways. In some, like our simple network, we can do that just by looking at it. And we can easily establish a framework if we pinpoint the unique reaction and the degrees of freedom, and then establish the base. So for further reading, you can look at the Stephanopoulos book, chapter 12, pages 535 to 551, and I will see you on Friday for a flipped classroom activity.